Hi everybody, Scott Stanchfield here. Let's continue taking a look at using Google Map in our applications. The project you're going to see in the sample called code is called Compose Map, and underneath the app, source, main, Java, we have main activity, which is what we just did for that previous example. Uh, the code is a little, little, some of the order of the code is a little bit different, but it's basically the same code. And then that just takes us to MP6 at APL and puts a marker down. And so now we have a Google Map inside of a Compose application. Yay! Now let's do things a little bit more interestingly. This setup, using this disposable effect and the map view up here and the Android view, is going to be the same every time you're using a map. So it'd be nice to pull that out into some common helpers. So what I've done here is created this Compose Map file here, which does all those things that we just saw. So we'll see here that we have this composable function called compose map, and he gets passed in that save instance state that we're going to need, and the on map ready call. And he's going to do all the rest of the type of stuff we did. So he's get, grabbing a current context. So instead of having the access to the activity directly, we need to grab it through local context current. We're going to do a remember of our map view, setting up the context. And then we're setting up the life cycle with the disposable effect, getting our scope, setting up our Android view. In the update after the map is set, we're going to await the map and then call the passed in on map ready function. So most of the boilerplate is done inside of this function. The only thing that's a little bit uh, I'm not super happy about is that we're referencing this ID outside of these functions. So you not only need this compose map, you need to make sure that ID is defined. What we could do alternatively is go ahead and say view dot generate view ID, and that'll create a brand new view ID. I'm going to go ahead and do that. Since we're not actually using that ID directly, that should be just fine. But we're making sure we're generating one that's not used anywhere else. Now to use this version of it, I created main activity two. In main activity two, you'll see there's almost nothing inside of here. We're just doing the exact same stuff, except instead of explicitly spelling that all out, we're doing the compose using compose map, passing in the saved instance state, and our what to do when the map is ready code. So in this case, we're going to add the marker, do our camera update factory. Everything should act exactly the same. We've even got the same latitude and longitude in here. Let's set this up so he'll run. I'm going to go underneath app, source, main, Android manifest and change this to main activity 2. And when we run him, we should see him coming up. Now note that the key that I have in this sample code, I'm going to delete that after I'm done recording these videos. So if you try running this, it's not going to work. You're going to need to replace that key in the sample code with your own key for this to work. But we'll see that this one actually took me back to the same place that we were. Now let's take a look at a little bit more complex example here. And to do this, we're going to do a, a, a car finder application. I'm going to start by looking at a car view model that I've defined. And uh, for this, I ended up grabbing a car icon from this flat icon location. Just wanted to give a little credit there. And our car view model has a few things inside of it that he's keeping track of. We need to know a location. So we're going to keep track of the current location using our normal setup of a private guy. I'm going to rename him because I prefer the underscore now instead of the zeros. Some of this code was from my previous term of the class and then I'm modifying it. So it's a few things like this that I'm going to clean up along the way as I see them. So we're keeping track of our current location and we're going to keep track of the car's latitude and longitude. Now what I'm doing inside here is I'm going to use the preference manager to save and restore the car lat long. That way, if you exit the application, we're keeping track of where your car was. If we didn't do this, the car is going to be completely gone when you reopen the application, if you happen to close or time out or something like that. So to do this, I'm importing the preference manager libraries. In my build.gradle here, we'll see that I've, I've now set things up. So I have this build dependencies gradle file. This allows me to just replace this entire file without modifying the dependencies. And each application just defines their own dependencies inside here. So inside of this 
Libs Bundles Base, we'll see that I've added in Preference now. And if I take a look at what Preference is, he is this Android X Preference Library. We need that to be able to save and restore things using the new Android X Preferences API. The Preferences API is pretty simple to use. All I need to do is say Preference Manager, get default shared preference for the application. And then inside of there, access the pieces that I need or save the pieces I need. Now in this particular case, this is when I'm creating it and passing in a default, in the default value, which I just want to read from the Preference Manager. So here I'm getting the lat preference by saying pre that whatever that shared preferences is dot get string. And I'm getting the lawn preference, nesting each of these inside of let clauses. So if either of these aren't pre uh, present, I'm not going to set it to a initial lat lawn string. I'm just going to let it be null. And the lets will take care of letting it be null for me. If I do have both a lat and lawn, I'm going to go ahead and create that lat long by taking those two strings that were in the preferences and converting them into doubles. So that'll be our initial value. So if we have a save value, we'll be good on it. If we don't have a save value, it'll be null for the car lat lawn. And then I expose that to the outside world. Let me do that. Over time, I learned things and better ways to do things. So you can see the code from previous term. I was just directly creating a second property here. Doing the git here is a wee bit more efficient. So I want to try to encourage good practices like that. So this keeps track of our current location and the car's latitude and longitude. And what I'd like to do is when I uh, end up changing this car lat lawn, I want to save that in the preference manager. So I've set up two functions here, clear, lat, clear car location and set car location, both of which will update the preference store. So clear let car location is going to say, let me go ahead and edit the preferences and then just remove those two preferences so that when I go read them up here, I won't have anything. And then I set the current value that I'm keeping track of to null. For set car location, I'm going to create a new latitude and longitude based on the user's current location. So I'm going to try to get the current location of the user. And if we have a value, we're going to update the preference store with those values and then create a lat long object. If we don't have a value, so if there's no current location, meaning we can't read the GPS or something, then I'm going to go ahead and clear the car location. I'll take that new lat long and just set it to the car's position just to remember where we are and return it. Update the current location if the user is moving. So if we're getting GPS information saying the user has changed their location, I just want to update that current location thing. Now, whenever these change, the car lat long or the current location, because they're in these state flows, it's going to notify the user interface that they've changed. So that should give us the feedback that will automatically update our user interface. So that's our view model. We're just keeping track of the location in the car lat long. Let's take a look at some little helpers here, just as long as I'm in here, the drawable helpers. This particular example, when I created it for my, my last class, I also went in here and put in uh, the, uh, the DACA tool for Kotlin docs. And just to kind of show you what this would look like if I wanted to make a nicely documented API. So we'll see here that these different functions, like these two bitmap, I put in a documentation comment here with references to classes in the brackets, and then attributes here that help describe this function in more detail. The receiver just describes what receiver is being used to call the function. Return is the return value. And if there were any params, it'd be at sign param. This sample guy is kind of nice because it's giving us the, a function that can be used as a sample so that in the documentation, it'll actually just show you the code for that. So if I control click on him, we'll see here's an example of that load bitmap function here. And this is actually a function we're going to be using inside here, but we can also use it as an example to show how that uh, load bitmap is being called. So inside of here, this is just giving us some helper functions to convert between different formats. So this will convert between drawables, which are underneath res drawable. We'll see here there's, there's this IC car, 
and he'll be able to convert him into a bitmap because Google Maps needs to use bitmaps to display the icons on the screen. So this is just a set of helper functions here to do that. I'm not going to go through all the details in these, but it's just some helpers, and you can read the documentation if you're interested. So now the interesting stuff, our main activity three. Let's take a look at him. This is actually our car locator application. I'm going to run this just so you can see what it does. And then we'll come back and look at the code in a little bit more detail. Well, it would actually help if I changed it in the manifest. Change it to main activity three. Let me run it. And here's our car finder. Note that I already had a car there. I'm going to throw the car away. Let's set it up so that it'll keep track of where we currently are. If I hit this little location icon here, it's going to take me to the last place that I had set it to be remembered. If I want to change that as though you know I'm walking around, I can go to the little extended guy here and on the map, change the location. So let's say that I want to change my location to here where I live at the vine. I'm just going to go ahead and click on that and say set location. And now if I zoom to my current location, it's going to take me right there. If I want to change that over time, I can change it. There's also some supports in here so you can set up a route and have it be able to move along that route. That's useful for simulating if you're driving or walking somewhere. But we'll just use that as our current location for right now. And let's say I want to drop my car right there. Boy, that made that car icon kind of big, didn't I? Let's see if we can tweak that real quickly here. And can I set it up to be a different size? Let's see what it looks like. So there's our car icon there. So he's setting up his size as being 96 by 96. Let's change that to be 48 and see how that looks. Ooh, he's a squished car. Let's make him be 48 square. And let's see if that makes it a little bit more reasonable on the screen. That's a little better. I think I like that size much better. So we'll do that. We'll use that size. So now I've placed the car where I currently am. And what I'm going to do is move to a different location. So let's bring up that helper here. And let's say that I am actually up over here. I'm going to say set location. So notice that my blue marker moved. And now if I use my walking directions, it takes me over into Google Maps and shows me a walking route to get there. And I can zoom in and out to kind of see what it is. It says it'll take me eight minutes. I can walk that way. And I should be able to get to where my car was. If I go back, I'm in the application again, and I can delete my location to forget it. So pretty simple little application, just keeping track of things. There's a few main concepts we need to work with in here, though. Get him out of the way. Let's close him. And let's take a look at our code. So in the setup for the activity, we're looking at our view model to start with. We have a variable to keep track of that Google map. And now we're actually going to take care of uh, our location using something called a fuse location provider. And what this will do is this will take advantage of GPS, network location information, cell towers, all sorts of different things like that to try to figure out its best guess at where you are. The more information we have as far as uh, the fine detailed location or coarse detailed location, the better this guy can provide an accurate location for us. This all depends on how the user has set up our application. So what I'm going to do is let's uninstall this application here. And I'm going to rerun it. And notice how it brings up this dialog here asking us for approximate or precise location information. I'm going to see, say precise which is going to let us know exactly where we are. If I went approximate, it's going to give me kind of a guesstimate of where the user currently is. And I think when I run this in the emulator, if I use approximate, it's going to think that I'm out in California somewhere. So I'm going to go with precise and say only this time, so I can make this choice each time I run the application. 
If you want to always use that option, you can say while using the app. And that will allow us to use the precise location from the GPS. Okay, so if I go to where my location is, let's try to jump there. There I am right there. The car icon will hold on to there as well. We're making all these be late init variables. We're just add, telling the compiler, I know I'm going to set this before I use it, so trust me. In order to use this fuse location provider, I need to set up a location callback. And this is going to be attached to the provider and be called each time the location changes based on the parameters we sent to the location provider to say how often we want to be called and things like that. And what we're going to do is anytime our location changes, we're going to go to the view model to update our current location, which is going to update that current location flow so that we'll know that the data has changed. Our on create here, we're going to, first of all, have to make sure that Google Play Services is available. Now, the way that Google Maps works and several other libraries on Android is a lot of them are delivered through Google Play Services. And the reason they did this was so that a lot of functionality can be updated without the, the phone makers having to get involved. Originally, anytime they'd have a, a change to any of the, the core libraries in Android, they would have to wait until the phone maker could actually distribute a brand new version of Android. And that's really bad for security because sometimes it would take these phone, uh, phone makers quite a while to get an updated version of Android available. So what they did is they started moving more and more things into what they call Google Play services so that these can be downloaded and updated on the fly. That way, if there's any security issues, they can update them that way. The location functionality is part of Google Play services, as are the map functionality. So what we want to do is, first of all, make sure that Google Play services are available. And we do that by calling Google API availability, get instance, make Google Play services available. And this will try to install Google Play services if they're not installed because depending on the device that might not be installed this gives the user the choice it'll jump to the google play store help them through the actual installation process so if we have our google play services we're going to call this on success listener which is now going to do some permission checks so up front we're going to check to see do we have fine or course location if we take a look at the way i've written this here i'm checking to see if permission for fine location is not granted and the permission for course is not granted that means that I don't have either of those permissions so in that particular case I want to try to get permissions so I'm going to use this location launcher here to try to access the permissions if we do have one of those permissions I'm going to go ahead and start up the map and do everything like that now if for some reason Google Play services isn't available we're going to use this and this failure uh, listener here to tell the user that they need Google Play services for the application. Our location permission launcher here is going to do this register for activity result to actually launch an external activity to do the permissions check and get back a map of what's been granted. Now in this case we called request multiple permissions because we're asking for the, uh, the, the course location and the find location. The granted is going to be a map between the name of the permission and whether it's granted or not. And so what I want to do in here is basically say if the user granted any of them, so if he granted fine or course, I'm going to go ahead and start location and map. And notice that's the same call I made up here. Up here is saying if I already have the permission, call it. Down here is saying if I'm coming back after the user granted it, call that to set up the map. Now if the user didn't grant anything, then what I'm going to do is put up a little dialogue and tell them, hey, we really need this information. If you, if you don't have this information, we can't really do our job. It's not a useful application. In this example here, I'm using the old school version of alert dialogues uh, because in this particular space, it's really tricky to use Jetpack Compose for doing things because I'm, I'm doing this outside of a composable function and I'm getting a callback from when the permission request was made. So in this case, it's actually a little easier to use the old alert dialogs. And these are pretty simple to use. 
you just say alert dialog builder, set the title, set the message, what to do for the negative button and the positive button. And I actually want to put in here a set cancelable to false. So similar to what we did for Jetpack Compose dialogs, where if you tap outside the dialog, it can cancel. I want to deny that here as well by saying uh, set cancelable false. What I'm doing inside this dialog is I'm giving two options to quit the application, which just calls finish. So it'll exit the activity or application info, which will go into the settings for this application and allow them to change the, the permissions. So if they hit that, this intent, we're calling start activity to go over to the, app, the application settings. This will take us to the application settings for our current package, which is our application, which is actually pretty nice doing it that way. When we set up that call to go there, I'm also calling finish so that if they hit back, they don't come back to the same dialog in the application. Once I've got that all set up, I'm just going to show the dialog. Now this is almost correct to do this. I really should be using a, a, a dialog fragment so that if the user rotates the screen, it'll stay up. If you do need to do this, I recommend you take a look at a dialog fragment for this specific part here, because if I rotate the screen, we're going to lose this dialog. So now let's take a look at the code that's called once the permission checks are done. This start location and map here was called when we said if we already had permission, call it or for granted permission calling it. And so what this guy's gonna do is, is actually try to set things up once we know we have permissions. Note that I needed to add this suppress lint here. If I didn't have that, let me go ahead and just delete it so you can see what's going on. Inside here, we're getting a flag here saying call requires permission, which may be rejected. And it's nice that it's flagging that, but the way we've written the code here, we know that's gonna be the case. Their lint tool just isn't picking that up quite right. So what I did on here is just hit Alt Enter and where it says add suppressed lint missing permission, boom, added that up there and now everything's fine. Um, only do this when you know you've got the code set up right like this. The only way that this is callable is if we had permission or if permission were granted. So the first thing we want to do is set up our uh, checks for where we are or location. We start off with a location request here and we say location request create this gives us information for the uh, the location provider to say how often we want to be notified and so i said you know we want high accuracy so if possible make sure we're getting the highest accuracy we can like use gps and we're going to get notified every five seconds or as fast as it wants up to that we'll get a hold of our location provider client and then call request location updates using that guy and passing in a little callback. That callback we had up here again, remember, is just updating our view model so that whenever we get a new location, we tell the view model that. The view model puts it in the flow, which will update the UE. So then inside of here, this is where we're actually going to be calling our set content, which ends up setting up our user interface. So we're going to take the data that's exposed from our view model, the current location in the car lat long, and collect them just like we did with anything else there. And we're going to set up a car marker that we're going to remember. We're going to set up our coroutine here so that later on when we actually need to start things in coroutine, we have it. And I'm creating a couple little helper functions here. Note that these are nested functions, so they have access to that car marker. And I have this set up so that set car location says remove any marker that exists. And we're going to create a brand new marker from the current car location. So we're going to just call set car location, which just locks in where we are. We're going to get back the lat long of where we currently are and just add a car marker at that location. Clear car location is just going to remove it and clear it from the view model. So it's just a couple little helpers that make managing this car marker a little more easy, which in some circles is called easier. I really don't know why my mouth says things that my mind really doesn't want it to say. But uh, I could edit that out, but no, it's more fun to have it in. So now we're actually going to have the user interface defined. We're using Jetpack Compose here. We're having our little toolbar at the top. This is a custom toolbar function that we're defining with these uh, on set car location, on clear log car location, and on walk to car. These are the three action buttons that we're going to have and what we're going to do with them. And on the walk to car, this is actually going to launch Google Maps. If we take a look here, this URI 
is a Google Maps URI which says I have my origin, that's the current location, and my destination, which is where the car currently is. My travel mode, walking. And this URI, if I pass it with an intent to set activity, is actually going to invoke the uh, Google Maps. This particular one here, we're saying explicitly, only allow Google Maps to answer this intent. Normally, other people could register intents in their applications to catch this URI and have it launch their apps. But here we're saying explicitly, we only want Google Maps to manage it. And then I just got a little bit of cleanup down in here that just says we can't locate because we don't have a car, a car or a current location. The main content of this, I'm going to go ahead and grab my car icon, loading the bitmap constructor. Note that this is done once when the map has been loaded. This is the on map load function. So I'm not worrying about the, remember here, the car icon is just held as a field up here. So inside of here, I'm going to have Google Map keep track of the is my location function, which gives us a little blue dot on there. That way we don't have to draw it. And we will create our car marker if we have an existing lat lawn. So if we had loaded this car lat lawn from the preference store, we're going to go ahead and create a car marker. So as soon as we open the application, boom, we have it. And we're going to go ahead and zoom to that location so the user knows where their car is. If we don't have a car marker, then we're going to run this code inside here. And this one here, we're just giving it a rough location where we want to actually focus the map if we don't have a, 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 a current car location. For this place, I actually chose three points on the APL campus. And I wanted to set this code up because you're going to need to do similar code to this in your assignment. In particular, this lat long bounds tends to be a little non-intuitive to use. And the whole idea here is that every time you call lat long bounds including something, it returns a new lat long bounds. It doesn't modify the existing one. He's an immutable object. So I'm just giving you a little demonstration here of how we can add points to a lat long bounds and get back a new lat long bounds. Now I do this with a little helper function. You don't have to use this helper function, but I found it kind of, kind of interesting here. What we're doing is updating this variable anytime you call add lot long bounds. So anytime you're adding to a bound, we're saying including it and then replacing the existing lat long bounds variable. Note that if we don't have a lat long bounds set, we need to create one. And we create it by passing in two points. You have to have two points for it. If we pass the same point in for both of those two points, that's just our initial starting location. After that, we just keep adding new points to it. And this lat long bounds essentially creates a bounding box we can use to zoom. I've also set it up so I'm just going to draw some, some lines between some of these points. Once again, because you're going to need to do this in the assignment. It doesn't add anything to this particular example. But if we take a look here, let's zoom out here. And I go up to, I thought this was around APL. Oh, because I had a car marker when I started, it didn't put any on the screen. I don't have a car marker now. Let me go ahead and close the app and restart it. And now we're seeing, here's the polylines. These are the three points. Oh, I must have something to remove that. Oh, I do. Down here, I have a coroutine to remove them. But those three points were defined to define a bounding box that I'm going to zoom to. And then I just drew those polylines. So again, this is a useless feature in this particular application, but I wanted to show you how this was done because in your application, you're going to need to draw lines between points. So here I'm setting up polylines. We're drawing them. And then this little coroutine after three seconds removes those polylines. Once I have my lat long bounds, I'm doing an animate camera to the new lat long bounds, passing them in there. And this is something you're going to need to do in your application. Every time the, we get new UFOs in the region, you want to make sure that your bounds is containing all the places the UFOs have been because they're writing a message in the sky. Our add car marker function that we're calling up here 
whenever we change the car location is just one that says, hey, Google Map, add a marker, and here are the marker options, position, anchor, icon, title, and snippet. The snippet is just a little pop-up that's going to show up above the icon. So if we come over here and drop at our current location, and I tap on it, this is the snippet that shows up up here. It says, I parked here, and here's the lat lawn. So I just have that information listed inside there. He uses that car icon, which is a bitmap. And for the anchor, think about it as though if you put a pin at this relative location in the marker. So in this case, we're talking the center of the marker, halfway on the X, halfway on the Y. If you put a pin there, where is that pin going to hit the map? So the point, if we put that pin into where we want our location on the map, this position, then the center of the icon is going to be at that position. So if we look here, our pin is going right through the center it, and the center is on top of our current location. So that's where our pin is. Uh, if we had different types of markers, so there's some markers that might look like a teardrop, for example. So if we looked at, you know, this is a good example here. When I drop a marker here, this type of marker, his anchor is down here at the bottom on this tip. So it's going to be 0.5 and 1. It's going to show where that guy is. So depending on what type of icon you're showing, you're probably going to want to vary your anchor. For your assignment, your anchor is going to be through the center of the UFOs. So it's going to be very similar to this. The anchor is going to be 0 0.5, 0 0.5. But if you had different ones, like this guy, or maybe some kind of little arrow pointing in a direction, think about where that, that, icon, that anchor should be so the user really knows what point you're trying to represent. And so then down here, this is my final piece here, is the toolbar. This is my toolbar for this application that's going to do these three buttons. And those buttons are defined saying, if I have a current location, then I'm going to put the set car location button up. If I have a, a car location defined, then I'm going to have the walk to car and the clear car. So these, these icons will change based on those parameters here. And that's the whole application. So there's not a whole lot here to do some pretty good functionality. And the Google map wasn't too hard to, to incorporate. From my point of view, the hardest thing to get right here was the, the fused location client and doing the setup for the Google APIs. The documentation on that is it's there, but it's a little sketchy. And there's some conflicting documentation that I've seen. And so sometimes getting this right, especially when you have permissions you have to ask for, getting everything in the right place for doing that can be a little tricky sometimes. So there's a nice little example of using Google Maps in your application. Depending on what you're trying to do, this might be really all you need is to display a location on the map and then zoom into there. I've done several applications that do that.